I want all y'all brothers okay. and some of y'all sisters. I've been seeing some of y'all tweets too, especially y'all FBA ADOS folk. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. How many federal executions took place under President Barack Obama? Maybe not in within our borders, but outside of our borders, I can think of at least two, at least. Anwar Awalaki and his son, they were executed by Barack Obama. They were US citizens. It has been almost a week since the state murder of Marcellus Khalif Williams. More accurately, Imam Marcellus Khalif Williams. And a lot of us have had a lot to say. With that being said, I want to share this because it was an issue that I think uh, is important that we touch on. Marcellus Khalif Williams was a innocent black man that was murdered by the state. Even the DA, as well as many others in the state were saying, we need to at least stay the, the the execution. We need to, uh, you know, really he should be released. It is absolutely not right. Uh, he is an innocent man. There were calls to the governor. The governor said no. Uh, and as well as the U.S. Supreme Court said they didn't even want to hear it. They said no. And so a lot of people were calling to people who are running currently or the current president to try to push for clemency for somebody like Marcellus Khalif Williams. But not a word was said. I want to share this first before I address uh, what Roland Martin said. Shout out to my comrade on RBN, Rome. He had this to say. And uh, to be honest with you, I co-sign what Rome says here. Fucking minutes. That's all we asked for was for five fucking minutes. We didn't ask you to hold any bills. We didn't ask you to send in the troops. We didn't ask you for any of that. We just asked you for five minutes from our sitting president and our VP who's running to be president running on black issues but when another innocent black man is getting killed by the state you are nowhere to be found and actually I found out that we can't even type his name out on your HQ without it being taken down this shit is disgusting it's funny how she's black and black and collard greens but here we are here's your time to shine Camilla and I know you bitch ass niggas. The government don't work like that. It don't work like that. No, 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 no. They have power to do something about this. Even if it isn't ink to paper, they have voices to put not only the millions that's watching this around the globe, but billions of people eyes on this. And they can sit here and watch the state make excuses for lynching another innocent black man. And this is not the only innocent black man that has been killed by the police or the state this month we couldn't even get five minutes from you and you think i'm going to spend five minutes in the line voting for you fuck out of here i am so sick of five fucking minutes yes rome is correct once again 
All we wanted was five minutes for you to at least make a statement to put pressure on the governor to stay the execution of an innocent man. And they couldn't even do it. Kamala Harris, who is currently running for president, was quiet. Not a word. Apparently, someone like Roland Martin takes issue with us calling out Kamala Harris for not for, for calling out Kamala Harris. So Roland Martin said, this is for all the black men and women criticizing Kamala Harris about the Marcellus Williams execution. This was a state crime and there was no federal jurisdiction. But y'all were aware that prior to Donald Trump, there were three federal executions in 60 years. Trump executed 13 in six months. Save that bullshit for someone else. This is why I'm supporting Harris Waltz. Y'all need to learn, read, and listen. Hashtag facts matter. So we're going to go over what Roland Martin said. And um, I'm going to be addressing what he's saying. Because I think this is important. Because he is going to be attacking people from the right. But I will be criticizing Roland Martin from the left, because he never addresses those mm -hmm. of us who are on the left. Let's get into it, shall we? All right. Take it away, Roland. Black men, I've been seeing a whole bunch of y'all tweeting about the execution in Missouri. I've been seeing a lot of y'all tweeting about Kamala Harris. She ain't say a word when that black man being put to death. Y'all overlooked the fact that it was a Democratic DA who wanted the man uh, taken off a death row. Y'all. So with that being said, if it was a Democratic DA that wanted him taken off of death row, then that should have made it easier for Kamala Harris to go, you know what? A Democratic DA wanted him taken off a of death row. I agree with that. We need to take Marcellus Williams off a of death row and we need to stay his execution. She could have just said that. Boom. Easy. Right. But she was quiet. That was a layup. That was all net. No backboard. And yet, shall we continue? Yes, let's continue. I'll forget that it was a Republican attorney general who stopped him, a Republican governor who stopped him, a Republican state Supreme Court who said move forward with the execution, a Republican U.S. Supreme Court that move forward. Which also adds to my point. That was a, that was a layup. That was easy because she could have said the Republicans want to keep this going. I say that if the facts bear out that this man is innocent, he should, we should stay his execution and he should be free. That would have been a layup for Kamala Harris, and yet she didn't do it. How many minutes are we in? How many seconds are we in? We are 51 seconds in, and Roland Martin's already proven my point. Already. She couldn't even, she couldn't even collaborate with the other Democrats in order to help stay this man's execution. Let's continue.
But you may be asking, well, Roland, why are you bringing up executions and Donald Trump? Now, y'all remember, th th this, was, this was the ad that he took out right here. Now, right, now first of all, no, this, this is Yusef Salam's response, but I, got, but I need y'all to remember. This is Yusef Salam responding to Donald Trump. Donald Trump wanted to, to kill the Central Park Five. He said the death penalty, they deserve the death penalty. Okay, why am I bringing that up? Donald Trump lost in 2020. Y'all know what he did? He told Bill Barr, who could we execute? Again, I, I want all y'all brothers. I've been seeing y'all tweets. I've been seeing y'all posting. I want all y'all brothers who have been talking all that trash I want y'all to answer this for me. How many people have been executed on the federal level by President Biden, Vice President Harris? Now, Roland. Let me go to my notes, because I got some notes. And I would like to address that uh, claim from Roland Martin. Now, Roland, if you want to talk about executions via the state, let's talk about the war crimes from both Biden and Donald Trump. You see, here's the thing, Roland. I'm not one of those black men that's on the right that you're addressing. I'm actually one of those black men on the left, right? The thing is, is that I also am against a Kamala Harris presidency as well as a Donald Trump presidency because guess what? I see them both as the same. Why don't you? What did Kamala say about the state of Israel? She said that she is unequivocal and she has unconditional support for Israel and will continue to support, which means she's going to continue to send weapons and aid to Israel as they are committing an extermination of Palestinians in the region. You see what they did in Lebanon. So we, don't, we want to talk about executions via the state. Let's talk about the wars that are continuing under the wars that continued under Obama, the wars that were continued under Trump, because guess what? You can say that Trump didn't start any new wars, but he damn sure didn't stop any. Okay, so Donald Trump kept the wars going, and then you had Joe Biden that kept them going even further. Oh, well, he pulled out of Afghanistan, but yet how many mercenaries that we got still in places of Afghanistan? How many troops that are still technically there? Even though it was a pullout, look, the Biden-Harris administration is continuing the program of war. They didn't really move the needle anywhere towards liberation and peace at all. So if you want to talk about executions via the state, outside of our borders, it's definitely happening. You see, you can cherry pick, oh, there weren't any federal executions. Yeah, when it comes to citizens within our borders. When Shireen Abdul Akla was murdered, who is a US citizen by Israel, what did the United States do? Under the Biden administration. When and we could also bring up some of the stuff that Obama did because he's a Democrat. Obama was one of the ones who also had a US citizen murdered. And his 16-year-old son murdered as well. 
So if we're going to talk about what they're doing as far as human life is concerned, Harris does not have any say whatsoever. Thankfully, I'm not a Trump supporter, so I can address this without having to defend or be on the defense for somebody like a Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump also deserves to be tried for war crimes, too. Let's continue, y'all. Zero. I want all y'all brothers okay. and some of y'all sisters. I've been seeing some of y'all tweets, too, especially y'all FBA ADOS folk. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh oh. How many federal executions took place under President Barack Obama? Maybe not in within our borders, but outside of our borders, I can think of at least two. At least. Anwar Awalaki and his son, they were executed by Barack Obama. They were US citizens. Oh, but you want to specify within the borders. I don't care inside the borders, outside the borders, Barack Obama also executed U.S. citizens. So, you really want to go there, Roland? See, this is the problem with the Democratic Party. You see, what they'll do is that they will cherry-pick the data so that it makes their party look good. Like, for instance, they'll say, well, we at the Democratic Party, we actually cut child poverty in half. That's not the flex you think it is. Child poverty shouldn't exist, period, in this country, number one. Number two, that child poverty cut in half, that expired. You allowed it to expire, so therefore, child poverty goes back up. So with that being said, you cherry pick the data for a small subset and then put it out there as absolute fact, when in fact, that's not really how it goes. So we talk about Barack Obama, he cherry picked the data and said within the United States borders, but doesn't want to talk about Anwar Awalaki and his 16 year old son, a minor that was murdered via drone strike by Barack Hussein Obama. Now, I'm not defending at all Donald Trump because Donald Trump damn near got us into World War III. So it could be very true, the 13 uh, federal executions. Yeah, so Donald Trump also should be, his feet should be held to the fire for that. But also, Donald Trump was also the one who almost got us into World War III by murdering a general in Iran. Qasem Soleimani. He almost got us into World War III with Iran. So, yes, of course. Donald Trump also deserves just as much scrutiny as a Joe Biden, a Kamala Harris, a Barack Obama, a George W. Bush. But he's defending Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama. All right. Let's have some more. Zero. Now, 
I want all of y'all to now answer the question. Okay. How many executions took place under Donald Trump? Mm hmm. Thirteen. If you go to my iPad, this is a Rolling, St Rolling Stone article. Trump's killing spree. The inside story of his race to execute every prisoner he could. Mm -hmm. Look at this right here. I, black man and black woman. Before 2020, there had been three federal executions in 60 years then trump put 13 people to death in six months so if y'all are posting tweets trashing the vice president kamala harris she didn't speak up loud enough. She didn't do nothing. Why well, y'all ain't mentioning this? I am. I'm mentioning it right now. Donald Trump is a reprehensible individual. He has no business being the commander in chief of this country. Neither should Kamala Harris. Neither one of them. Also, when we say silence is violence or silence is complicity, and Kamala Harris was silent, oh, but that doesn't apply to Kamala. Oh, we can't apply that to her, even though she has an immense amount of influence because she's the vice president of the United States. But you say, don't, don't do that to her. See, here's the thing. I don't expect anything like this from a J.D. Vance. But the party that used to have on this platform that it was against capital punishment, I say used to because they quietly took it away I expected the Republican Party to not care. So this is why nobody was saying J.D. Vance's name because we expect J.D. Vance to continue and not make any excuses for it and just continue on with the execution because we know the type of people that people like J.D. Vance and Donald Trump are. But far be it upon, be it upon us, to assume that because the Democratic Party had on their platform that they were against capital punishment, and then an opportunity to stay in execution, to provide clemency for a man that was about to be executed, and yet the Democratic Party went, Shh. Kamala Harris went, Shh. So are we to just assume that Kamala Harris was against it, but she she couldn't speak? Cat got her tongue. She couldn't tweet it out. She couldn't do a statement in her many press conferences that hopefully she didn't have her earbuds in so she can avoid, but she could have said something for five minutes, like Rome said, to influence so that somebody like Marcellus Khalifa Williams would not be executed. On RBN, I spoke about the execution or the soon-to-be execution of Marcellus Khalifa Williams a month before it happened. I spoke about it. 
So if I knew about it, Kamala knew about it, and she could have said something, but she didn't. Tim Waltz didn't say anything about it. He kept his mouth shut. So if silence is violence, if silence is complicity, which we on the left agree, Jill Stein spoke about it. Dr. Cornell West spoke about it. Kamala Harris didn't. Well, why are y'all not mentioning that after he lost, he was racing to kill people? He literally told Bill Barr, let's take him out. Let's go. Lead, sto lead paragraph, Rolling Stone. In the final moments of Brandon Bernard's life before he was executed by lethal injection at a federal penitentiary in Terry Hart, Indiana on December 10th, 2020, President Donald Trump picked up the phone to entertain a final plea for mercy on Bernard's behalf. The call was not with Bernard's family or his attorneys, nor was it with representatives with Bernard's family, uh, nor was it representatives from the Justice Department's pardon attorney office, who had recommended just days earlier that Trump spare Bernard's life. Rather, the call was with Jamal Fincher Jones, better known as Polau Dadon, a music producer responsible for hits like Ludacris, Pippin' All Over the World, and Nicki Minaj's Anaconda. Jones didn't know Bernard, but he had publicly endorsed Trump for re-election. And that, Bernard's advocates had correctly suspected, gave him the best chance of getting the president's ear. Hmm. Trump took the call, but unfortunately for Bernard, it was too late. The president had days earlier spoken with the family of the victims in Bernard's case, a young couple who had been kidnapped and killed and promised them the execution would go forward. I'm sorry, he told Jones, I can't do it. I'm gonna scroll back up. Representatives from the Justice Department's pardon attorney office had recommended just days earlier that Trump spared Bernard's life. So for every single one of you brothers, and sisters who wants to criticize Biden and Harris for the state execution in Missouri. There were, there have been zero federal executions under Biden Harris. There were zero federal executions under Obama Biden. There were 13 by Donald Trump in six months. And before I go to break, I'm just gonna leave y'all with this right here. Before 2020, there had been three federal executions in 60 years. Then Trump put 13 people to death in six months. Now you tell me, who should be the 47th president of the United States? No sign. <laughs> oh, oh, you thought I was going to say Donald Trump. No. No. See, the violence done by Donald Trump and the silence and complicity and violence done by Kamala Harris, two good things can be true at the same time. This is why I love the fact that I'm not in a duopoly. This is why I love the fact that I do not have to defend reprehensible behaviors from people like a Donald Trump or a Kamala Harris. Because neither one of them should be commander in chief. Neither one of them should have any power within our government at all. They shouldn't even, they don't even qualify to be dog catchers. And so you're coming and pointing to the guys that are like, oh, man, I'm going to vote for Trump. And why hasn't Kamala uh, actually said anything? 
But some of us who are criticizing publicly, we're not Trump supporters. We're not on the right. I'm on the left, baby. And I do not support the duopoly. And I can point out both Trump and Harris's transgressions on this front. Because I'm not a Democrat show. My opinions are not based on, you know, the Democratic Party. And staying with that in that circle so you can uh, make as much money in the algorithm as possible uh, because it actually is more lucrative to stay within the duopoly. To me, the mission matters way more than the money. You want to see how much money I make? Go to my Patreon. You'll see. It's not nowhere near what you probably get. The point is, is that I can actually call out Kamala Harris for her silence. Why can't you? Let's finish this up. Trump or Harris that ain't even a contest. It's absolutely Vice President Kamala Harris. No, it's not. I'll be right back. I'll roll a button. Up. No, you won't. Now, I'm going to share this with you. Because Kamala Harris's silence is pretty indicative of how she actually feels. I want to share this because there's some things that a lot of people do not take into consideration. And, uh, well, I want to. Let's take a look at this. Let me enlarge. So, Attorney General Kamala Harris was even worse than you think. The blurb says she was less interested in justice than she was running for her next office. <laughs> All right, so it says anyone interested in justice was entitled to feel at a Chris Matthews thrill up their leg when Tulsi Gabbard went after Kamala Harris for her record as state attorney general in the Detroit debate. By the way, this was written in 2019. So this was five years ago. Gabbard pointed out that as California's attorney general, Harris refused to allow DNA testing that would have exonerated a death row inmate and prosecuted more than 1,000 marijuana cases as though as a candidate, she later laughed with radio hosts about her own pot smoking past. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Harris's tenure. There's also the case of Daniel Larson. After 11 years of incarceration, a federal judge ruled that he was innocent. Harris kept him in prison for two more years while she appealed the decision on a technicality. She argued that Larson hadn't provided proof in a timely manner. This is not only bad conduct with regard to wrongfully convict. This is not her only bad conduct with regard to wrongly convicted citizens. My two indirect experiences with Harris's department during her tenure as attorney general from January 2011 to January 2017 reveal a similarly callous regard for justice. This first was a pro bono habeas investigator trying to free an innocent young man named Eric Frimpong from prison. The second was an author chronicling the wrongful civil prosecution of a California company by both state of California and the Department of Justice, and both the deputy attorneys general working for Harris, if not at her best, seemed less concerned with doing justice than keeping the conviction count up and scoring a payday for the state. The case of Eric Fring Pong would never not break my heart. Eric had come to the United States from Ghana in 2005. 
recruited by the University of California at Santa Barbara to play soccer. He learned English, made friends, and did well in school with his dual math majors and impressed almost everyone he met as charming, bright, and ingenuous. In his second season, the center midfielder at the UCSB to the national championship, he led the USC, UCSB to the national championship in his first in sport. Hailed as a hero was draft by the Kansas City Wizards of the major soccer, major league soccer and planned to play professionally after graduating in June. But less than a month later, in February 17th of 2007, a freshman accused him of sexually assaulting her on the beach below the cliffside apartment she shared with several other students. So he said, I spent, I spent two years investigating every aspect of the arrest, trial, and conviction, doing what the defense attorney, Robert Sanger, and his paid investigator didn't do. During trial, Sanger was unfamiliar with the prosecution's evidence forwarded to him under discovery, so he missed a myriad of contradictions and self-refuting statements that would have allowed him to easily undermine the prosecution's case. And because he never visited the sites pertinent to the case, he didn't understand that the prosecution's versions of events was logically, chronologically, and geographically indefensible. Worse, he essentially stipulated that the case's veracity without offering the jury any reason to doubt it. No wonder they voted to convict. A decade ago, I spent 20,000 words citing the evidence I'd uncover to explain why I'm certain that whatever happened to Jane Doe, the perp couldn't possibly have been Eric Frimpong. Without question, he had been railroaded by racist cop and conscienceless assistant district attorney interested in not in justice, but in convictions. And then he'd been abandoned by a do-nothing defense attorney. Everything I found was compiled into a 700-page petition for a writ of habeas corpus filed in Santa Barbara Superior Court in December of 2010. The petition didn't just raise reasonable doubt, it established Eric's incidents. When I hadn't suspect until then was that the trial judge, Brian Hill, was equally worth of, of contempt. As a presiding judge of the court at the time, Hill assigned himself to the petition and then broke judicial canon by trying to refute the substantial evidence in the petition with his own research. One example should convey the flavor of how perverted was his denial of the petition. So he goes over the denial. So he continues here, says, when you see this sort of thing once, maybe it's just a slipping through the cracks. When you see it over and over, it begins to look more like someone's plan for career advancement. And advance Harris did, not Eric Frimpong though. After serving his seven year sentence, Eric was deported to Ghana where his math degrees ought to have guaranteed him a secure future. Alas, as a lifetime registered sex offender, he can't work for any multinational company, nor for the same reason he can't even coach soccer. He is left to scrape by as best as he can. In short, his life was ruined. So he goes over the cases that Kamala Harris and how horrible she is. I also want to share this regarding Kamala Harris as well, because I think this is also important. So somebody in RFK Jr.'s camp was actually talking about Kamala Harris, and I think this is actually very interesting. So let's go into this right here. This is actually kind of funny. It starts off kind of funny. This one, folks, is going to be so empty, such clear water. You're going to swim in it with your kids right in Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, if y'all believe that, I got some beachfront property on Mars I can't wait to sell you. So Robert Kennedy's plan to create unity actually involves helping us dismantle corporate capture, which is the actual swamp. And there's a really interesting example of that that involves both Trump and Harris that I think we should dive into. So this example of corporate corruption involves a guy you might have heard of named Steve Mnuchin. Well, Steve Mnuchin 
got into a lot of trouble because he short sold people's houses by the tune of like 80,000 via foreclosure. He was the foreclosure guy. So when Kamala Harris was the attorney general out there in Northern California, she was urged strongly by her consumer protection department to prosecute Steve Mnuchin because of his corrupt foreclosure business. And she had a record of holding big banks accountable before. So it seemed like this is what she would do, but she did not. And the reason why she didn't is quite interesting. So one of Mnuchin's partners was One West Bank, and one of the shareholders in there was a dude you might heard of named George Soros, him again. The reason why she didn't pursue it could have something to do with Mnuchin donating large sums of money to Harris's campaign at the time. So now that Harris refuses to prosecute Mnuchin, guess who appoints him as Treasury Secretary? Donald J. Trump. Mnuchin is just one example of how both parties are subject to this kind of influence and corruption. And me as a voter, I'm concerned about if either one of them gets into office, what's changed? More and more voters are starting to see this corrupt merger. And that's also as part of driving them to become independents who identify with neither party. And we understand that when we fight each other, these corporations profit. In fact, the former CEO of BlackRock says so himself. I think what's happening today in the markets is a endorsement of divided government. If we want to be free from this kind of corruption, it's going to have to start with the voters. We, the people, are going to have to cast our votes for candidates. All right. So, of course, he's advocating for RK Jr., who is no longer in the race. Uh, so you can take that, uh, you know, take away with that. But this is true. So let's take a look. Let's look at the donors, shall we? Donor Lookup. This is why I love this site. This site is such a great resource. Money to candidates. St Steven Mnuchin in Pasadena, California. Employer Citigroup. Date, February 10th, 2016. $2,000 to Kamala Harris. Another one. 2700 from Heather Mnuchin, Kamala Harris. Heather Mnuchin again, $850 to Kamala Harris. That was in 2019. Heather Mnuchin, $850 in, 20, in 2014 to Kamala Harris. Heather Mnuchin again, $1,000. Heather, uh, yes, to Kamala Harris in uh, in 2010. Heather Mnuchin again, $1,250 in 2010. And then another $6,500 in 2010 to Kamala Harris. So the Mnuchins have been busy giving money to Kamala Harris. So we know that she's just as corrupt. Now, let's take a look at this too. He brought this up. This is out of the Huffington Post. Kamala Harris has to answer for not prosecuting Steve Mnuchin. So this came out in August of 2017. It says Kamala Harris has been deemed the Democratic Party establishment's next big thing. They're pushing her as the figure head of the resistance, the anti-Trump as staunch, strong progressive who relies on her intelligence and empathy to combat the authoritarian belligerence of the current administration. While Harris is certainly poised and intelligent, her progressive credentials are fuzzy and her past is punctuated boldly by her decision to not prosecute One West Bank and the foreclosure king who ran it, current Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. Steve Mnuchin and One West Bank were, according to the memo obtained and reported on by The Intercept, guilty of widespread misconduct in the form of over 1,000 legal violations. The memo was the result of a year-long investigation and asserts that One West Bank operated to intentionally boost foreclosures. The campaign for accountability 
called for a federal invest investigation of Mnuchin and One West Bank, claiming that they potentially illegal tactics to foreclose on as many as 80,000 Californian homes. That despite internal memos explicitly mentioning numerous prosecute prosecutable offenses by Mnuchin and company, the com California Attorney General Kamala Harris refused to prosecute. She's never given an ex exemption for her decision, and Mnuchin later donated two thousand dollars to Harris' campaign. It was only his only then donation to a Democratic candidate. So, as we can see here, that's Kamala Harris. Now, Kamala Harris is so much like Trump that Trump saw something in her. And Donald Trump even donated $5,000 to Kamala Harris' campaign. Now, with that being said, Kamala Harris' campaign sent the donation back. But why would Donald Trump send $5,000 to Kamala Harris? He saw something in her. Maybe he saw himself. So no wonder somebody like a Kamala Harris has been quiet. Because somebody like her probably agrees with Donald Trump a lot more than Roland Martin is comfortable with. At least he doesn't want to say it out loud. So as a black man, Kamala Harris is no friend to black people in the United States. Just like Donald Trump is no friend to black people in the United States. When it comes to our liberation, when it comes to justice, real justice within this country, neither Harris or Trump are fighters for it. They are facilitators of our oppression. And they have shown so much in their record and in their history. So in regards to what the comments of Roland Martin have said, does, who deserves to be number 47? Well, damn sure ain't Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. You can take that to the bank. Thank you so very much for watching my channel and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.